Okay, I hope you're seeing my screen. Yes. So I I made it in Bookdown, but I haven't pushed to our GitHub repo, but it mm -hmm. should be straightforward. Okay. So, okay, so for this chapter two, we are uh, going through the structure of civil objects. And afterwards, after we understand what make a civil object a uh, civil, mm -hmm. then we will also um, go through how to convert an ordinary data frame that you get either from reading um, CSV file or Excel file to a civil right. object. And afterwards, we will also um, go through the differences between trend, seasonal, and cyclic pattern of time series data. I get the understanding that the author seems to observe that beginners tend to confuse um, these terms or use those terms interchangeably, even though they should not. So I think it would be very important to go through this. And then afterwards, we will um, go through basic plots for time series analysis, such as seasonal subseries plots, autocorrelation, as well as correlogram, which we can make after we do the autocorrelation analysis. So there are several functions that we will um, learn in this chapter. So as civil to, um, well, to make the civil object and autoplot, which I think is quite amazing how it can be aware of what you do upstream of the autoplot function. And then we have the GG season, GG subseries, GG lag and ACF that we will um, discuss later on. So, all right. So this is the bare bones of a civil object. So by default, the civil will you, so there are several terms in the civil. So here we see the index. And this index is always the time of the observation. And by default, the civil object will only have one measurement per year. But of course, you can have more measurements per year, such as um, every month, every week, every quarter, and so on. And we will uh, look at how to do that later. So, so it's like, okay, after we set the uh, values in the data frame, so this is just like an ordinary data frame or ordinary table. And that, so this is the year, the observation, so whatever values, such as um, GDP, for example. And after entering the, these values, then we set the year as index. Okay. So as I mentioned, we can also use other, um, other time. Um, so, okay, so the index of time is called a time class. And other than year, we can also other we can also use other time class function. So for details, it's um, it's in chapter two, subheading one, the civil objects. So we can have annual, quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily, and so on. And we can use um, yeah, yeah, we can use this function. So it's just like mutating the time index into whatever index that you want. Okay. All right, so here I'm converting, um, yeah, I'm converting the year month or the month to year month. And then afterwards, I'm using as Siebel to assign month as the index. All right, okay. So these are the other intervals that I mentioned. And we can also store multiple time series in Siebel. And we can use key to distinguish the time series in the Siebel object. So here we have an Olympic running data. So it is all available after loading 
the FPP3 package. Um, so it's a package that accompanies the book. And so we don't see we don't see it here because I'm just printing the first 10 rows of the civil object. But within this data frame, there are two unique categories of the sex, which is the which is men and women. So these are so this means that this um, data set contains two time series for each sex. And yeah. And we can use the sex as the key in our civil object. So yeah, so so index is just to indicate the time and key is to indicate the group of time series that you have in the data. So if you have um, a civil object for stock prices, then the key would be the, the, yeah, the company for the stocks and so on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think you're referring to the ticker, the ticker symbol. Sorry? For, for, for the stock price, you know, that, that you have a date, you have the stock price, but then you need an identifier for the company. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that, that, that is called in finance uh, ticker symbol. <laughs> Thank you. I need yeah. to learn the lingo. Right, right. <laughs> okay, so as you mentioned, we can use various study first functions with um, Siebel. Well, I think we are all aware at this point of the common tidy first functions. So I wouldn't go too much into this. And here is an example of how we can convert an ordinary CSV files or any other data frame object that you have imported into R to a simple object. Uh, Mikhail, so, uh, yes? I, just have, I just have a comment that, you know, maybe for people that are going to watch it, maybe are not aware, uh, if you can go a little bit up, uh -huh. uh, to that uh, block, that chunk. Okay. Uh, one curious thing, because uh, we're going to use that. Uh, we're going to use that 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 data set that that table. We're going to use it later. Okay, because I'm working in chapter four, and we're uh -huh. going to use that one, especially in one of the exercises. And it's interesting to notice that when you run, you know, run the filter right. ATC uh -huh. equal to A10. So you are filtering for the A10 for that, you know, key. Then you select the month, you know, which is the, 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 the time index, then the concession, type code, et cetera. But then you summarize. And that was a little bit weird for me because usually what it follows the select in a regular data frame is a group by. Okay. You know, if, if, it's, if, it's, if it was not a symbol, and I did the, you know, I did the, the, the test. If it was not a symbol, you need a group by, because you have to say, okay, I'm going to select these columns, right? Then I'm going to group by, and the group by will be by the month, of course, okay? And then you summarize. But here in the symbol, the group by is not, is not required. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so oh, yeah. in other words, in other words, it already is implicitly uh, uh, saying that, okay, I'm going to select that if because I have that index, I'm going to group by by that index, you know, by default, okay? And then we summarize and mutate and all, 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 the, all the, you know, do the manipulation, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But that's really key here because for example, when I started working in chapter four, I didn't recognize that the symbol already does it. So I did it, I did it back <laughs> again. <laughs> Okay, and it gave me the, the same the, the, the same results. You know, it didn't change, but it's oh. it's something that we have to be aware. Of, okay, because usually when you work in a data frame that is don't have an index, okay, as this one, uh, you have to group by, okay, yeah. because you have to tell which are you know what what are the group bys where I'm going to operate for the aggregations, okay. So that, that that's something that you know we, we should keep in mind. That's all. <laughs> all right. Yeah, I think that's an acute observation of yours. Yeah, because I just right. took it for granted. So right. <laughs> what I assume why it doesn't matter is because here we're just um, summing the cost for all the types. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, which is, yeah. We right, have basically what he's doing group. is, what, what he's doing is group by by month. Mm -hmm. um, because it's group by, by month, the concessional type, they're going to be group, you know, they're going to be group. They're going to be slides. okay? So it's going to group by month, and then it's going to summarize, okay? Mm -hmm. Because that, that's what, yeah. you know, that's, that's our intention. But usually that's what you do, you know, in this type of operations. But with the Sable, if you're going to group by the time index, you don't have to specify the group by. <laughs> yeah, I think that's nice. Mm -hmm. All right. So yeah, moving forward. And this is just a way to identify the key. And we can use multiple columns as the key. So this is just to, yeah. So I, yeah, I really like what you um, um, pointed out just earlier. So we can think of this key as a group by um, function. Oh, uh, no, no, um, no, that's for the index. So sorry, I got confused a bit there. But yeah, we can use right, multiple columns are, for the key. Right, the, the, the keys are the ones that maybe you can, you know, uh, group by if, if you want. But if you mm -hmm. don't specify a group by, then it's going to group by by the time, yeah. the timing. All right, so um, yeah, I guess the, so yeah, I think the index is always, um, it's always um, remembered by the simple object. Because here, for example, if we call an autoplot for this um, data set, so this is a data set of a slide from um, Melbourne to Sydney for economy class. So it's just the number of passengers um, per uh, 1,000 passengers. And here I'm just using, so I'm just calling autoplot on Melbourne economy, which is the civil object. And here the, um, the variable that I want to plot on the Y axis. And it automatically uses the index as the time variable on the x-axis. And I think this autoplot is quite handy, um, especially for interactive analysis, because of course we don't really want to use all the um, verbose CD plot to a uh, grammar to do such interactive analysis. And uh, yeah, just like other CD plot um, function, then we can use, then we can yeah, uh, add the uh, labels or titles and so on using um, ordinary ggplot function. So there are a lot of variety of data sets preloaded by the FPP3 package. I don't really go through all of them, but well, in one of the exercises, they recommended us to look into uh, the, into several data sets and describe basic things about the data sets they, that they have preloaded within the package. But we'll go through that, I guess, next week. All right. And yeah, so what you see here and also here, so we can just see a pattern. So using this time series plot, we can hopefully see a pattern. Well, so there are various patterns, either regular and irregular that we can see in this plot. And the patterns actually have name. So there are three important patterns in time series data set. So first of all, it's trend. So trend is defined as a long time increase or decrease within the time series. And it does not have to be linear. So in this plot, the trend is, well, we have an increasing trend from the first observation to the latest observation. And of course, it's not really, so, 
we cannot really draw a straight line from the first observation to the last observation because we have fluctuations through the time period. And for the fluctuations, and for such fluctuations, so there are two types of time series fluctuations. So there are seasonal and cyclic. So whenever the time series are affected by seasonal factors, or if we can associate the pattern with the calendar date, then it is seasonal. And a seasonal pattern is always fixed and known. So for example, um, summer holiday or ho um, holiday season, we know that it usually peak during the summer or the December to January season. And for the cyclic time series pattern, so it's just an unpredictable pattern with rise and fall with no fixed frequency. So if it is not seasonal, then it must be cyclic. And it's easy to remember which pattern is seasonal. So again, if we can associate the pattern to a calendar date, it's seasonal. Oh yeah, so Mikhail, also a quote from the book, yeah. I, I just posted a link that I found that is from the author, uh, Jaime, mm -hmm. uh, that explains more in detail and gives you more examples of you know the difference between cyclic and seasonal uh, time series, okay? Mm -hmm. So that yeah. uh, maybe we can, you know, when when we uh, well, when you push it to the GitHub, maybe you can include it in the references. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Because yeah. it explains a little more in detail. Because in the in the book, it's only about you know a couple of paragraphs. Okay. Yeah. And then that's it. But it's here he, he goes a little more in detail. And he gives a couple of, uh, you know, a, 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 a couple of, uh, uh, you know, smoke, it's like a smoking gun, right? In terms of, you know, how, how do you detect the seasonal? How do you detect the, the cyclical? Okay. And usually cyclical has a longer, you know, has a longer span. Uh, the seasonal is more like, a, you know, it could be monthly, it could be quarterly, right? It could be even year. But mm -hmm. the, the cyclical is the one that really spans. And he gives, a couple of samples, very especially the ones with the lynx trapping in Canada, uh, that the cyclic that the, the cycles are like eight to ten years, okay. Mm -hmm. But you have to see it in the graph, you know, with that, you know, with that, you know, frequency, you know, by, by year. So ah, all right. Ten years. So like I say, exactly that one, that one, yeah. Uh, and and it, and it kind of you know now, now it makes a little more sense because they say well you know seasonal and cyclic and, and, and cyclical could be you know very similar right you know because it's, it's, it's always a pattern right but seasonal is more for the like the short term that, that i inter interpret in the short term mm -hmm. like weekly uh monthly quarterly you know some patterns that you can see that they go you know they, they kind of repeat themselves in the cyclical is more you know at, at, at the long term hey sorry i just joined uh can you all hear me yeah yeah okay um, Sorry, I was a little bit late. Um, yeah, so I my understanding, I know on the top of that page, it, it says that um, the fixed period bit, uh, and I think that's really important. Uh, so, mm -hmm. like if like like basically, if you look at the time between or the number of um, you know data points between the beginning of two, uh, like the beginning of that cycle, right? Um, that and then you look between a bunch of them if if those beginning points are not or different uh lengths of observations between the two then um then it's a cyclic pattern um mm -hmm. so um so i feel like that like to me that was like an important important bit of it um where, cause like, they, I like how in this, I haven't seen this page, but this is really cool. It says like mm -hmm. seasonal time series are called periodic. So right. I don't know. I feel like, like, just like thinking about it for me, at least between like periodic versus non-periodic, um, you know, might 
uh, like a, another way to like kind of uh, drive it home, I guess. But. Hmm. Yeah, but when yeah, when now I'm reading that season is also called periodic time series. Mm -hmm. For me, at least, it's like a source of confusion because cyclic is also periodic. I guess yeah, I don't but... really understand the nuances of every word mm -hmm. choice, but mm -hmm. to me, it's a bit confusing here. Yeah, it's. I think he's just saying that the number of of like of observations between the beginning of each cycle for, mm -hmm. for cyclic for cyclic is not the same each time. So maybe one time, you know, the kind of rising up on that, on that curve or whatever is going to be, you know, uh, uh, yeah. it might be, it might be 10 weeks to the next one. Right. Yeah. And then, and then the next one, and then when it comes up, up again, and it's up at kind of that point where it's rising up again, maybe it's two weeks to the next one. Mm -hmm. And then, and then it's 12 weeks to the next one, you know? Um. All right. I just don't know, like, I, I guess I'm wondering like how, how if, if it isn't of a fixed period, how do you like take advantage of that pattern? Like if, if, the, if the period isn't known in advance, you know, like how would you, how would you model it? Um, you know, maybe it's like some kind of probabilistic thing where it could be between eight and 12 or something like that, you know, and it's like most often 10 or around 10. I don't know, but maybe it's something like that. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, pre precisely, uh, you know, later in that article, it tells you what is the, you know, what is the consequence of why you should, you know, identify uh, the seasonal patterns and is and is very is a cyclic uh, pattern because of the model. Okay, uh, some of the models assume that your uh, time series are seasonal, cyclic, or even you know uh, non-stationary, like a, like a ring. Okay, so uh, it 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 gives you uh, you know it gives you a hint of what kind of model you should be using. Okay. <laughs> So it goes, it goes, you know, it goes hand in hand there. Yeah. So these, these are kind of like exploratory diagnostics and kind of picking apart the different aspects of a time series are going to give you hints as to what, how to model it. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because some, some, you know, most of the models, especially the, the, the traditional ones, you know, the, the exponential uh, time smoothing and the ARIMA, uh, they assume certain things about about those time series that are present. Present then would not be, you know, uh, a good forecast. Yeah. Did you add yeah, this link uh, to the? Yeah, Ricardo has put it in the chat, so I assume that John will post it later in the okay. um, Slack channel. Cool. So yeah, I think the importance of identifying whether the pattern is cyclic and seasonal, if we think of it probabilistically, so let's say we are forecasting on a monthly basis, and right now we're on May, then we, and let's say we're forecasting the, um, the number of flights, then I guess we can use the, pat the pattern from the previous years as some sort of prior for what would happen in the coming few months, right? So yeah, I think that's the importance of, well, um, identifying what sort of pattern we can see in the data. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know if you talked about this, sorry, I just want to uh, add one more mm -hmm. thing uh, very quickly. Sure. Um, something I didn't realize before, I've used the, t uh, t I don't know how you say it, t t t Sybil, Sybil, uh, like, I don't know how you pronounce the time series Tibble package, but anyway, uh, T.S. Sybil. Um, <laughs> uh, something I didn't realize before is that like, based on the uh, time, 
the date time kind of type, it will uh, assume what the, the period is, like how long it takes for it to repeat um, and come back to the same time inter time observation or time unit. Um, and then, and then I think the like the models use that what for like at least for the fable packages and like what Rob Hyman is showing um, uses that information from the actual TSIBLE uh, object to kind of use it for modeling. You know, um, I didn't realize. I just saying I didn't realize that before. I've used it used it a little bit, um, but like I didn't realize it, it. Like based on the date time type, it like would encode information about period and things like that. Hmm. Right. Oh, yeah, there are a lot of things um, that is hidden in this packet, I guess. And I also noticed that, um, that we can also quickly change the index um, to group our, to aggregate our time series with the index by and summarize. So I think this combination, this combination of two functions, so group by key and index by, followed by the command for the, the time class function, it's sort of like a shortcut to go around whether you want to look at your data annu annually or quarterly or on a monthly basis. And it's, bit unfortunate that it's not explained in the chapter two because before I saw this, I felt like it's a bit tedious to go around from one indexing to the other, but apparently it's not. So it's just me not knowing the full extent of this package. All right, so, okay, seasonal plots. So after, Looking at this time series plot, we can also look at the seasonal plot. So the seasonal plot is just, um, well, showing the time series from January to December, but then now you have lines for the year of observation. So we can see here the data from 1991 to 2007, if, 2008, if I'm not mistaken. And this is the data for anti-diabetic anti drug sales. And as we can see here, there is a, a large term of sales in January for the anti-diabetic anti drug sales. So these are probably due to sales in late December because to my understanding that the government provided like um, a huge discount. And because of that, the customers will stockpile for the drugs but the sales are not registered until January. So I guess the lesson that I can take here is that always remember how, well, always find out how your data is recorded because if you don't know anything about how the sales are registered, then we can suspect, okay, is something happening in January whereas the increase of sales actually happened on December. And then um, we can look into, uh, so there are also um, seasonal subseries plots. So it is sort of like time series plot, but then you group by the key that you have in your data. Oh, no, so this is not the seasonal time series plots yet. So this is just a group by of, um, of, uh, so this is just a, a group of time series from you know, somewhere around 2000, 2015 for the number of, um, I guess the number of tourists, oh yeah, oh, the number of overnight trips across all states in Australia. And here we can see that, um, we can see patterns in the data. For example, here in the, um, purple and gold lines, the peaks are aligned. But then if we look closer, the peaks for the green lines and this, this particular green and this particular green are just different compared to the other. And this refers 
to the Northern Territory and Queensland. And these are the Northern part of Australia. And this sort of makes sense because um, the Northern Territory and Queensland are on the Northern part of Australia. And I assume they have a different climates and different um, temperature during the, throughout the year. So if you're using the sub seasonal subsidies plots, okay, oh, I should have, okay. So we have a quarterly data of the overnight trips for, um, yeah, so, and he, so here every facet represents the state and every line represents the year. So we can see the variation in, or the seasonal variation in the time series data within each state throughout the year. And we can see that there is an increase at the first quarter in the Western Australia, Victoria, Tasmania of Australia. But then here we notice that Queensland and Northern Territory actually has peaks at the third quarter. And that can be explained by the difference in climate. And I assume that during the holidays, people would go to a place with warmer climate. I just want to say that, uh, sorry to interrupt, but that these yep. seasonal plots uh, and the sub-series ones are really cool. I, I, uh, I feel like I've always tried to make something like this in ggplot and like by like making new variables or kind of, you know, like extracting something like that's like a week or whatever and, and fascinating by that. But the fact that it just does this based on how the index is encoded or whatever and what your keys are is really cool to me um yeah like it seems i'm going to use it next week at work <laughs> like it's it's awesome yeah yeah all right so um okay all right so I forget what is this one. Um, okay, so this is a GT subsidies plot. Okay. Sorry, lack of preparation, I guess. All right, so what we are seeing here, so every facet represents the quarter. So it's like a zoom in version of this one. A so yeah, the column of the facet is the quarter. The row is the, the rows are the states. And um, so, okay. But then on the x-axis, now we have the years. So we can compare the seasonal um, pattern across the years because here with this visualization, we cannot clearly see the year. We, we can see that, okay, this observation in this unknown year is lower than the rest of the years, but we cannot really see which year is it. I mean, we can, of course, add the label, but then the label will overwhelm the plots. So this is a handy um, tool to see um, whether there's any um, true increase in the observation um, in any of the season. And here we can see that the tourism in Western Australia markedly increased in recent years regardless of the quarter. So here we have, um, so this is, uh, so the blue line indicates the average. And here indeed we can see that in Western Australia it's always above the average. It's mostly on the highest, um, around the highest point compared to the other region, whereas here is not that high, it's decreasing and so on. Okay. All right. And so that is, okay, so seasonal plot and subsidies plots are very useful if you want to take a look at the 
pattern or the time series pattern in a more detailed manner. But if you want to explore the relationship between time series, and here they have an example between uh, of associating time series between the half hourly temperature, so just the um, climate, with the off hourly electricity demand. So here, if we just plot the time series individually, the relationship between the two is not that clear. However, if we um, plot the temperature against the electricity demand, then we can see that there is some sort of um, association between the two, even though it's not linear. But this can be explained by the fact that if the temperature are high, then there is an increase in electricity demand due to poor air conditioning. And when the temperatures are low, we also need electricity to heat up the house. So this correlation plot is useful if we want to, well, not really correlation, but scatter plot are useful if you want to, to look at the association between two observations. All right. And now we are going to lag plots and autocorrelation. So I'll just go into this autocorrelation because he has written the formula and I'm too lazy to <laughs> rewrite the formula on my own. So, okay. So what it basically does in autocorrelation, it is just meshing the relationship at time t with, for example, time t minus one. And you can vary the, what is called the lag or the difference between the current time and the previous time that you're correlating to whatever value that you want. You can make it to two, three, four, or even a hundred, depending on the, well, not really, yeah, depending on the length of your time series. So this is, so this is why it's called um, autocorrelation because this a correlation between um, within one variable. So with, uh, between one variable and it in itself, but on different time points. And the lag plot is very useful to, uh, if it is very useful to indicate uh, to dissect what pattern can we see, and also the period of the pattern in our time series object. So here, every point, um, oh, one moment. Okay, so every facet represents the, um, the number of lag. So it's just the association between T and T minus one, T minus, um, t minus two, t and t minus three, and so on until the ninth. And so the color represents the, um, the quarter and the dot, if I remember correctly, it's for the year. And if you are seeing an association or here what we are, if we are seeing a strong positive relationship at, so, okay. so in this plot, we can see a strong positive relationship at lag four and lag eight. So this indicates because, so there is this regular period in the, in the seasonal pattern, in the pattern, so we can say, or we can suspect that this indicates a strong seasonality. And indeed, we can see a negative relationship at lag two and lag eight, lag six, sorry. So we can imagine that at lag four and lag eight, we can see the peaks 
whereas the at leg six and leg two, we can see the trunk. So this is um, a quick way to see, or uh, a more robust way to see what sort of um, relationship that you can see within your time series. And uh, what we are doing here is sort of qualitative to do it more quantitatively than we can do the um, autocorrelation analysis. And I find it very nice to see how simple it is to do this just by piping the civil object into the ACF function and then by identifying the length, the maximum um, length from the time of observation. And we can fit it to autoplot to see how the correlations change with lack of k. Okay. And again, we see at lag four and lag eight, the positive relationship and at lag two and six, the negative relationship. And this is very useful. This autocorrection plot is very useful if you want to look at the lag for um, a long period of time. And we need to remember that this is the autocorrelation observe t against t minus um, the lag. So the plot is actually going back in time. Uh, so the first observe, um, the first observation here are the zero point is the T. So uh, I guess it's more of a reminder for me. So we can also see a combination of both trend and seasonality using this plot. We can use the diabetes drug sales example. So remember that the autocorrelation plot goes back um, through the time. So here, at the very last observation, so so the like one month, so at four years ago, the price is at this point, and it steadily increased until it reached this point. So we can see that that is um, an increasing trend in diabetic drug sales throughout the years. And within this outer correlogram, we can also see seasonality. As, as indicated by this subtle scallop pattern. As mentioned earlier, we see that there is an increase in sales on January due to customers stockpiling the diabetic drug because apparently on December, the government made a, it gave a huge subsidy for um, the customers. All right. And that is also um, what the authors call white noise, which is time series that show no autocorrelation at all. So, and yes, and if we look at the, yeah, I mean, I guess human eyes are um, like, we want to see pattern everywhere. And I guess if we have, um, predisposition or maybe a preconception to see, okay, there should be a pattern in the data, then we would, um, we would say that there is a pattern, but we can use autocorrelation or autocorrelogram to really see whether there's any pattern at all in our data. And well, at least to my eye, there is no um, pattern that we can see in this plot. And Therefore, we can call this time series as a white noise. So and that's it for the chapter. So, well, I've went through the exercises, but obviously I haven't worked through all of them. So yeah, that's all from my side. Thank you, Mikhail. Good, good. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks for the links and you know, the lingo that you taught me. Yeah. <laughs> ticker, ticker symbol. <laughs> yeah, ticker symbol. Yep. Yeah. AAPL. AAPL is Apple. 
MSFT, Microsoft, you know. That's my, oh, yeah. that's oh, part yeah. of my portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it hasn't been a great week, you know, for the stock market, so, you know. <laughs> oh, is it? Uh, oh, yeah, it has gone really down. <laughs> But you know, things go down, things go up. You know, it's the trend. It's a trend that you should be, you know, worried about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> right. Okay, so um, I guess that's it for the chapter. So, what should we discuss next? Should we discuss the exercises, or should we go through chapter three directly? Well, I don't think the exercises is actually that difficult. But we can also use the time to do the exercises to consolidate mm -hmm. what um, we read from the chapter. So personally, I don't have any preference, but how about um, you both? Yeah, I, I, I go for the exercises. All right. Yeah, because that, that's when you, know, you have to apply. You know, yeah, what you saw in the, in the theory, you have to apply it there. That's true. Yeah, that's okay with me. Um, so that would be next next week. We do the chapter two exercises. Is that the, mm -hmm. the idea? Okay. Okay. And how should we divide the exercises then? Should we? Um, should I just make a signed up sheet and everyone can volunteer which um, exercise they want to present, or should one person go through all of them? I think it's a bit hard on that one person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how I mean, many, how many exercises are there? There's 12 for this chapter. Okay, but I mean, we don't have to do them all, right? No. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah, maybe you can present just like one or two of your choice, but exactly. we don't have to cover all of them. Yeah. I think like um, the question, question number one is very basic, just hmm. identifying the time interval or the index of the time series. I mean, is quite straightforward, but I think there are exercises that also fun to do. Right. So okay. yeah. So yeah, yeah. We can, I mean, I mean, we can, we, we, we can ju just them. choose a, a mm -hmm. couple of exercises, and yeah. if we, uh, and, and, and if we coincide, you know. In, in, in some of them, then we can see, you know, what was the approach? Maybe yeah. maybe there was something different that you saw that I didn't yeah. see. That's true. We can always compare notes. Right. Yeah. yeah, I like the idea of picking a subset and then everyone doing those and then and then talking about them together because then we can speak yeah. from a, share, a shared kind of experience, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I also noticed after doing several book clubs, if everyone are doing their own set of exercises, then I don't really know what to comment uh, what the yeah. others are doing. So yeah. Yeah. honestly exactly. speaking, yeah. All right, so yeah, nice. So we have decided what to do next week. 